All right, this is inspired by QZB. Not much of an intro this week, but I wrote a short QZB inspired track and I'm going to do a full track breakdown. So this is quite a long video. Uh, if you want to see how I made this, then the full stream of me creating all of the sounds for this is up on Twitch. And if it's expired from there, it'll be available on my Patreon. Uh, this project and all of the patches that I made are also available via my Patreon. But uh, let's get on with it. Inspired by QZB. All right, so we are here in Ableton and I'm going to play the tune that I've written as an inspired by QZB. Here we go. Okay, so that's a little demo tune that I put together. Um, and I did that by having a bit of a listen to some QZB tracks and uh, just taking notes about what sort of basses they used, what sort of percussion they used, and then uh, reconstructing that as best I could in a pretty limited time. Um, so I'm not saying that this is perfectly a reconstruction of a QZB tune, but it's certainly something that was inspired by various QZB tunes. So uh, let's have a look at what I did and why I did it. Um, so sidechain trigger. So this is a pretty common thing. I hope you've seen it before. I've just got a little audio click here. And that's just playing on any kick and any uh, snare hit so that uh, a sidechain can be triggered. Now there's multiple sidechains scattered throughout the project because it's a little bit messy. Uh, for example, this hat rack, I'm using gate to do some side chaining here. So here's the uh, hat loop. And so without the gate, and with the gate, it's kind of ducking around the kicks and the snares a bit. And you'll notice I'm using the floor amount to control how much the ducking happens. Um, and so that's pretty much controlling the, the depth of the ducking. Um, I like using gate uh, as a side chainer, I guess just because it's slightly different to a compressor. Yeah, you set the threshold pretty pretty easily and change the release. As long as flip's engaged, you use the uh, release time to control how long it takes to get back up to the peak. I did make a video explaining um, a couple of different options for side chaining and uh, yeah, why I landed on gate as something that I would use for a little while. So that's uh, what that side chain trigger does. Now the drum bus here is pretty straightforward. Uh, let's loop the drums. So you can hear the hats winding in and out around the kicks and the snares. That uh, side chain is really important to get the right pulsing kind of effect. Um, if we turn it off, you'll see it just sounds a bit too straight and static. Thank you. 
yeah, uh, I really like a bit of heavy side chaining on hats. Uh, it's probably a stylistic thing, and if it's not your bag, then you don't have to do it. Um, let's have a look at this slightly busier drum loop. Uh, the only difference here is really more hats. Um, so let's have a look at this drum rack real quick. Uh, all that I did for this was I grabbed a whole bunch of these stock snare drums. There they are. Um, and I dragged them into this rack and I transposed one of them up a bit. And then I just used right click copy value to siblings to, to uh, pitch them all up by an octave. They become a little bit brittle and you know not quite like regular snares. They're kind of like weird little accent hits. Um, and then I went through and I just sequenced up a couple of little rolls. Um, and then I used beat repeat to uh, enhance those rolls a little bit. But so if we have a quick listen to this, uh, I used my DIY transient shapers, which I think I've explained in a video to tighten that up a little, uh, take out all of the subs, auto pan to make it move around and saturate it just to clip the transients and make the whole thing a little bit louder. Oh, so we're saturating by 12 dB in the end. And this beat repeat I set onto um, 130 second note repeats so we get little rolls and fills and trills and stuff out of it so you can hear it doing re-triggering and stuff sometimes um yeah i just liked the sound of that so i left it on um, so that's these two tracks we've kind of covered. Now the actual kick and the snare. So the kick I built in Serum from scratch. So here's the kick. Um, so we've got an acoustic layer. And that is once again just a stock uh, Ableton uh, sound. Which one is it? Let's zoom right in on it. Oh, here we go. Kick, short and solid. One. Um, yep, yeah, and then beefing that up with a Serum kick. So the Serum kick, um, yeah, I've got a whole video about how I build kicks in Serum, but this one's essentially just two LFOs and um, they are just mapped to the volume and the coarse pitch. And I just tweaked the envelope until it sounded how I felt it should sound and then layered it up with that acoustic kick. So the acoustic layer has a transient, transient shaper just to get rid of any sustain at all. And it's got an EQ to get rid of any lows under about 100 hertz, probably coming off from, from about 300 hertz. Um, so that's the kick. It, to me, it sounds fine. Um, it, in a normal situation, I would resample that into a whole other track and, uh, and not have it separated out. It's just separated out so that I could explain it to you guys um, how to do it. Uh, the snare. Now the snare, um, I noticed that QZB really use short percussive noises as their snares. So I wanted to do something similar. Um, and I came across this fizz, which was a stock snare. So it's snare swisher. And by itself, without all the envelopes on it, it sounded like a pretty nice little 8080 style snare. Let's get the envelope sorted out. Yeah, which I quite liked, but I just wanted the uh, the tail really. Uh, it almost sounds a bit like a clap. Um, so I'm taking off the lows. And then uh, because that by itself is not very percussive anymore, uh, I wanted something with a nice little knock at the start to beef it up. So I got this snare vinyl, what is it? Snare vinyl 05, which is another stock snare. And just by layering those two together, So you could probably tighten all of this up even further, but um, I liked where I got to with it. So. so you can hear by extending this, it makes this whole sound sound a lot brighter, even though we're not changing the brightness at the very start of the sound at all. Now the, rack, the hat rack here is um, a whole bunch of stock hats that I've dragged in. Um, and I just sequenced up uh, layer by layer. So if I turn off these notes, actually we fold, that makes things a bit easier. So um, yeah, initially I just had these eighth note hats. Um, and then I realized I wanted a little shuffle, so I brought that in. 
and then I wanted uh, a faster paced uh, secondary hat that I could use to really increase the, uh, the perceived pace of the whole thing. Um, yeah, so just by layering up those individual sections over time, uh, created like what sounds like quite a full and busy set of percussion, but it's actually only four different samples being triggered. Um, and there's a there's a little uh, open hat at the start of the kind of phrase, which isn't so noticeable in the uh, the main drop. Okay, and so that's all of the percussion uh, that there is. Um, so we'll kind of we'll do the the easy stuff first. So. Um, So looking at uh, the kind of uh, accessories or effects, we got this, this fake rides. This is a thing that I like to do quite often. So it sounds almost like a ride symbol. So all it is is operator with a couple of oscillators working. So we've got white noise at the start and we just dial that amount up to taste onto two different oscillators that are just set semi-randomly to uh, coarse pitch values that are quite high. Uh, let's turn off the uh, noise. We got kind of metallic ringing sound. You can probably enhance that a little bit by detuning these. That's just a triangle and a triangle that are FMing each other. Then we add the noise in. It makes it sound more like a symbol or something like that. So I do this quite often because you can actually really tightly control the uh, transient of this sound by editing the envelope here. So in this case, it's got quite a long delay. Uh, without the side chaining on it, it probably sounds reasonably percussive. Yeah, but with the side chaining, you don't hear that initial attack transient because it's shaved off by the heavy side chaining. Uh, I've also got a chorus, which I'm using as sort of a comb filter phasey type thing. Um, so without and with, so it gives it that like hissy feel uh, and this gate is doing the sidechain thing which we've already covered only from the kick not from the uh, the sidechain trigger and with quite a long release so um, this sound essentially gets crushed back down whenever a kick happens and then blooms out over time and it doesn't duck so much for snares even there is a sidechain on this sidechain group which is crushing everything in time with the, uh, the actual sidechain trigger but this sound actually starts from the kick and blooms out and then com comes back in when the kick happens again. And there's an EQ just in there so I could see the frequency ranges that I was working with. And we're using the filter on the uh, operator to clean out the bottom end. Uh, without the filter, it'd be quite a full sound. With the filter, it sounds a lot more like a cymbal. Um, yeah, so I, I quite often create this fake rides rack um, when I want some uh, background atmosphere that's going to fill out the top end, but uh, I don't want it to really be percussive and I don't want to deal with the like um, EQing that I would need to do if I was using an actual sample. Or, you know, if you're using rides, they get stale. If you just re-trigger them, they, they sound a bit machine gunny. If you use synthesized rides like this, I find they tend to generally just work because they're a nice flat sound. Um, you, you can hear really clearly when they come in. <laughs> Yeah, you hear that extra metallic stuff going on in the top end. Right, now this white noise thing, this is a fairly similar kind of patch uh, in that it's just white noise and it's got a lot of reverb on it at fairly high wet amounts with a fairly long decay time. And then I'm using that chorus uh, comb filter phase thing. So um, without that, it's just a wall of noise. We're using the filter cutoff to uh, rise and fall. So that just sounds like noise, like pretty standard riser. But if we add the chorus in, so we get much more of that jet airplane kind of feel, uh, which I really like. Now, if we look at this reverb atmos, now this is just pads that I've created out of this bell lead thing, uh, just by pitching it down. So these are actually just a uh, resample of that riff bell, which we're going to cover shortly, and just transposed down with heaps of reverb on it. So heaps of reverb and then pitched down. So it's quite a long drone sound. 
Uh, I find that building your atmospheres out of other elements of your track lets them stay kind of like harmonically related. You can still process them further to make them different to your main sounds, but uh, it lets you, you know, have nice complementary tones to work with, um, which generally I do. Um, if I have a main lead sound, I'll generally process it to make atmospheres and stuff. So speaking of main lead sounds, we have this riff bell. So some of the character of that is built by these uh, effect units. Now these effect units you can get hold of if you join my Discord. There is a link in my Discord to download them. Uh, without that, it sounds like this. This is a pretty standard bell. Um, there's two oscillators. One is being FM'd by the other. And there's a chorus to widen things up. Filter mainly just to use the drive, and then nice long reverb. Now then these two effect racks, they're kind of based off uh, guitar pedals. This is Noisy Shifter. In here it's duplicating the sound. Uh, it's using grain delays to do that. And it's uh, pitching the, uh, the copies in strange ways. And then we got Verb Crunch. Now Verb Crunch is mainly a reverb, I think, and some overdrive or maybe tube distortion by the look of the dials. Um, and we've got an auto filter to shave off some of the top end and an EQ to get rid of some of the lows. It's just playing this little lead line. And it essentially just plays that through the whole song um, because I liked it a lot, so I just left it how it is. The filter does open up throughout the progression of the song. Um, but that's kind of just a mixing thing. You don't really need to worry about that too much. All of this is sidechained off our sidechain trigger. So you can see if we start it up here. So you can hear it sidechaining pretty heavily. Um, yeah, you can hear that click. Now, I personally don't worry about clicks on sidechains. I used to, and now I just don't. Um, yeah, if you wanted to get rid of the clicking entirely and bring the attack up to around six, seven millisecond, I have found by experimenting. But I don't actually think that those clicks really stand out in your mix when, uh, yeah, when they are present. So I use attack of the absolute fastest these days and up to you how you want to do it. So let's cover off the synths because these are really simple. Um, this is a reverb tail. Um, once again, this synth group is being uh, side chained uh, and having the lows EQ'd down a little. Now that reverb tail comes from reverbing this once it's been reversed. Um, and that noise is just a serum patch. There's not really much of a reason how I made it. It was just drawing in harmonics in here and then FMing from the sub and then using the bandpass with a bit of drive. Um, the distortion is using the cross shaper with a randomly drawn curve to it. There's not really any rhyme or reason to that. I just moved nodes around until it sounded right. Um, and then we've got another bandpass filter. Uh, let's and bandpass. Yeah, it's really just like honing the sound in. So it's taking off the the extremes. Then we got a compressor just to really bash the levels out. There's also these two overdrives, which uh, one is like overdriving the bottom half of the sound and one's overdriving the top to get the uh, frequency uh, distribution of the sound kind of a lot brighter. So without those, it sounds like this. And with, and the other one. So in here they make things a fair bit brighter. And obviously it's using quite an obscene amount of uh, whole reverb on a send. Uh, I don't use sends very often when I'm writing tunes, but in this case I decided to because pretty much everything was going to need a little bit of reverb to put it in a space. And so because I knew that I was going to use the, uh, the reverb a lot, that I would set up a send for it so I could just add it to anything as I needed it. 
Um, so that sound happens a few times here um, and you'll notice there's a second sound which is pretty much the same thing. Um, there's this sound here which I think is the exact same thing without the uh, overdrives and with some automation there and some automation here. So we're moving the band passes around over time. So this macro maps to that band pass cutoff and this macro maps to that cutoff. Um, yeah, but it's essentially the same sound. Uh, it's just in a separate channel so that I don't have to switch the EQ on and off and worry about it. Um, now this other, the first lead sound that we've had also plays this. And that's actually how I started off working with it. So if we just bring these together. So that little uh, percussive synthetic sound, uh, I really wanted to get in here uh, and it fills in a gap nicely. Uh, and it kind of, the drums happen, this synth noise happens, and then the main bass happens. So there's a nice little progression in the first couple of beats of each uh, measure where we go thump, da, 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 and then we hit the big doo bass noise. So if I play that. So you can hear that there's that nice handoff between these elements, nice big drums, small little percussive distorted synth thing, then into big distorted bass noise. Okay, so let's look at basses because I'm sure that's what people are most interested in. Here's the bass group at this point in the tune. So you can hear that it's mainly a Reese happening at that point. Now it's a pretty standard kind of little uh, Reese number. It sounds like this. So it's just five sawtooth voices. There's a triangle sub. Uh, there's a nice low pass filter with a little bit of drive, 12 dB slope. Um, so you could use a 24. I like the 12 because um, you can hear the stereo a little bit better because it's leaving in more high frequencies. So that's pretty much it. Uh, this macro knob controls this cutoff over here uh, in the negative direction. So that's just for in towards the end of the tune. I wanted to kind of like suck some energy out of this race. So just leaving it so that it's just the triangle. It makes it less stereo, less interesting, less vibey. So that's this race here. Now you'll notice there is this second race uh, which happens later in the tune. So we'll just play the bass section in this next section. So mainly what's going on there is some extra layers. So there's this layer for this note. There's this kind of bit which sits in the middle here, which is also happens in this section. And then there's this layer over these notes here. So this main Reese is providing the sub layer and most of the kind of like low texture. So you can hear that it's pretty similar. It's just opened up the uh, filter amount a little and we're using an LFO on the cutoff, just a very fractional amount, what's that, six, and another LFO slightly faster. So this LFO is doing quarter notes, this LFO is doing eighth notes, uh, and just on four amounts, a really tiny amount. So you can see it's just wobbling the cutoff around a little bit, creating a bit of extra movement. And so that's that Reese layer. Now that Reese layer pretty much continues the rest of the song. Then we switch back to the outro one and then we fade the cutoff down again. Let's get onto the other layers because I think they're probably much more what people are interested in. Let's do them in the order that they happen. So this little hit here. So you can hear that it's got um, two kind of stages to it. There's an initial little growly bit and then a nice little wow at the end. Um, what it is, is a sine wave being FM'd by another sine wave. So uh, without all the other effects on, let's see what that sounds like. That's pretty dull. There's not really a lot of interest to that. Um, <clears throat> So you can really get different tones out of that based on how much FM you put through it. Um, a good proportion of the sound is coming from this distortion where we're using the cross shaper. Uh, 
uh, which really distorts those uh, FM sounds pretty nicely. So the shape that I've drawn in here is really straightforward. Uh, this is the default, and all I've done is push that up. That's it. Uh, I haven't touched the drive knob at all, which probably should be all the way to the left. Doesn't really matter. Now there's a chorus, which just kind of makes things a lot more stereo. Probably mix should come down a little. Uh, and there's a bandpass filter. Which lets us get some really nice uh, growly movement out of it. And a compressor just to kind of flatten things out. And that's all this sound is. Um, now the automation for that is here. And it's just that filter cut off. Uh, yeah, really straightforward. There's these two overdrives which are really uh, enhancing the top end of the sound. And all that I'm using those for is really is sort of an exciter thing. I mean, I suppose it's straightforward overdrive. Um, but yeah, the... So to brighten that up with one. And then really push the top end. I've used dual overdrives on a lot of these sounds just to like really bring out the top end in them. Um, because I found that like it just sounded too... It sounded a little too smooth and subtle and dull uh, without really distorting it nicely. Um, then we take off the lows because we don't need the sub and we saturate it just to push the levels up and clip it a bit. All right, so then we come along to this. And you can see already, it's a very similar sound. Uh, we got dual overdrives again. Got a very similar amount of automation. And if you check it out, it's the exact same patch. Um, we are using an LFO on the uh, global tuning. That's just to give it a little bit more of a pluck at the start. So with it at zero, it's a bit boring at the start of the sound. And with it at maximum, every time it makes a nice little attacky click sound. Now most of that attacky click doesn't come through in the actual mix because the side chaining cuts it off. Uh, we've got this cutoff mapped to the filter over here. And otherwise it's the exact same patch as the other noise, except the FM amount is slightly different. Um, I think it's all the way down on this where it was, you know, at 15 degrees up on the previous patch. But it gives quite a different texture. So you can hear that they're quite different sounds, uh, even though they're coming from the exact same tone generator. All right, and then we've got this sound and this other one. I think this is probably very similar. Yeah, so this is almost exactly the same patch as this. The uh, overdrives are in slightly different positions in the, uh, the scheme of things, but you know, again, overdrives to really bring out the top end. Otherwise it sounds a bit too like subtle and smooth. And uh, once again, it's our FM bass patch. So the octave on the sub is pushed up by one, and then we've just set the FM from sub amount up a little. In this case, we're probably, let's call it 30 degrees. And that gives us a quite different tone. Uh, and that's that's the true for every position on this. Like we could... Um, so that's another patch built out of the same patch. Uh, and then this one is once again the exact same thing uh, with very different, much slower automation here and probably a different FM amount. And that's about it, no chorus, um, and, but the exact same FM signs into distortion uh, with the octave up one, just to get you know that that same kind of tone, uh, and then brighten it up and distort it with the overdrives. And take the bottom end out and then clip it. This whole section is really one, two, three, four different bass layers happening over a Reese, which is doing these sub duties for us. Uh, so without all of the other stuff going on, it sounds like this.
So that's really the base group. Um, so with all of those different elements happening, uh, I just created different sections um, by switching things on and off and then uh, doing some extra automation. That's the filter cutoff over time, making those fills happen at different points in the progression to keep things interesting. So that's really pretty much everything in here. Um, so I guess that was inspired by QZB. Uh, I really like the output of this and I think I got pretty close to that kind of texture and tone that they use. Probably it's a little bit busier than any QZB track is going to be, but that's uh, something that I do all the time is make things pretty busy. But I think in terms of getting similar sounds, hopefully that shows you how to get there. There's not really too much difficult stuff going on in here. It's just about balancing the amount of uh, the original signal coming out of your synthesizer. So, uh, you know, signs and pure harmonics and stuff. And then into pretty standard kind of distortions to really rough them up and get them uh, a bit growly. Um, and then you can use filters on your distorted sound to kind of like create more movement. Um, and then you can feel, you can distort again after your filter to uh, really enhance the like brightness of those filter movements. So I'll play the uh, tune out again, but that's inspired by QZB. Mm -hmm. 